It's always a pleasure to come back to a and I've been here several, year, several times over the 30-some years I've... Yeah, you can turn it on. Thank you. 30-some years I've lived in Austin. Um, and every time I come, it seems like it gets bigger. I, don't, <laughs> I was amazed at the growth around the university as well as the university itself now. You, know, so you actually have traffic jams around here, it looks like. <laughs> so I remember coming here 40 years ago, 35 years ago, and uh, it wasn't like that at all. But uh, it's always been a great university. So today what I'm going to do is uh, talk about uh, nutritional requirements for increasing muscle mass. I'm going to throw a little bit in there about aging, uh, but just a small amount because we don't have a, a lot of time. Uh, but there are some real considerations along those lines that uh, we need to consider. So when we talk about the use of protein for increasing uh, muscle development, all you know, protein is essential for normal growth and development. However, protein requ requirements can vary greatly depending on uh, condition, you know, on certain conditions such as age, body type and the amount and type of pattern of physical activity that one participates in. Research has cl clearly established that increasing protein intake in excess of the recommended daily allowance facil facilitates muscle development and strength when incorporated with resistance training, and this appears functional within all age groups. So the purpose of this presentation is to identify the amount and type of protein to consume to optimize muscle development and strength. Also, the timing and frequency of protein supplementation and the addition of carbohydrate on muscle development and strength will also be discussed. So a few facts. Dietary protein provides the building blocks for the synthesis of all tissues of the body, including skeletal muscle, as well as the synthesis of hormones, enzymes, nuclear material, and metabolic buffers. There are complete and incomplete dietary proteins, with complete proteins being those that contain an adequate portion of all nine of the essential amino acids necessary for the dietary needs of humans. So one essential amino acid of importance that we'll talk about is leucine, and it activates translation initiation, or basically protein synthesis, and proteins that contain high amounts of leucine have the greatest impact on protein synthesis. So the first thing we'll talk about is optimum amount of protein to consume per day to maximize muscle development and growth. Now if we look at the recommended daily allowance for protein, it's 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight per day. Uh, the re recommended daily allowance for protein represents really the amount necessary to maintain nitrogen balance and muscle mass under sedentary conditions. This is an insufficient amount to support the protein needs of older individuals who require about 1.4 to 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight of protein per day. And the amount is also insufficient to maximize muscle mass and strength when resistance exercise training. We can see this in some early work by Fern back in the 90s in which they had 12 subjects randomly assigned to a protein diet or a control diet. The control diet was actually 1.3 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. This is what the people were normally eating at that time in this group, this cohort. And the protein, the group that got the protein supplementation or high protein diet was 3.3 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. They did four weeks of resistance training, and I think it's obvious here that the, the group that <coughs> received the high protein diet had a much greater increase in uh, lean body mass than the group that was eating the uh, lower protein consumption of 1.3 grams per kilogram body weight per day, which is still above the RDA. So we can see what basically what they concluded was a positive nitrogen balance stimulates muscle growth. If we go to Tronopolsky's work and, and uh, Pete Lemon's work back in the, the 90s also, here, here's a study in which they took sedentary controls and strength athletes and they <clears throat> measured whole body protein synthesis over a 24 hour period and they gave the individuals either 0.9, 1.5, or 2.4 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. And then they looked at the amount of protein synthesis over that period of time. And 
what they found was is that uh, increasing the protein consumption of sedentary uh, individuals did not stimulate an increase in protein synthesis. However, those that were doing resistance exercise training had a significant improvement in protein synthesis when the protein in the diet was increased from 0.9 to 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight per day. Increasing to 2.4 didn't increase the amount of protein synthesis significantly more than 1.5. However, some other work by Lemon in that group uh, did some <coughs> work looking at uh, correlation uh, by, or regression uh, uh, values on different diets and so forth and protein synthesis. What they basically came out with was that to, if trying to increase muscle mass and strength, one should consume between 1.6 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight uh, per day. Right? Now, one of the things that we want to look at is distribution. So how do you take this protein? Do you take it all at once or, or what? So this is a typical meal pattern for individuals in the United States. So we can look at breakfast. We have very little protein in our breakfast typically. Lunch, it's increased. And then dinner time is when we eat the majority of our protein, when we typically have our biggest meal. Snacks are usually very low in protein. Now, <clears throat> what the lines represent, the first line represents the maximum proteins to maximize protein synthesis in young individuals. And when I talk about young, I'm referring to people that are uh, below 50 years of age or below 45 years of age. It takes about 20 to 25 grams of protein, quality protein, to maximize protein synthesis. All right? For older individuals, it's up or more around 35. So if we look at this, at breakfast, no protein synthesis or sm very small amounts of protein synthesis over the next couple of hours are going to be stimulated. For young individuals, you might increase protein synthesis to some degree after lunch, but most of it's going to be around the hours of dinner. Right? <clears throat> now, research has been done to show what happens rather than use this skewed pattern of taking in protein during the day, but equalizing the protein over, a three meal, over the three meals that you normally eat. And what we can see is that if you evenly distribute the protein breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that the rate of muscle protein synthesis over that 24-hour period of time is significantly greater than it is if you're skewing your protein or taking it all in at one time. And the reason for this is you need a certain amount of protein in each meal to actually activate and maximize protein synthesis, and this will last for several hours post-meal. So if you're skipping meals or taking in very low amounts of protein, you're going for a substantial period of time without stimulating protein synthesis. So recommend then individuals should have three basic meals per day. Protein consumption should be spread out evenly over the three meals. And a sufficient amount of protein to maximize protein synthesis should be consumed. And that would be about 25 to 35 grams of protein per meal. The upper limit for older individuals. <clears throat> now, we can look at supplement and timing of supplements as well. So this goes back to my original thesis on nutrient timing in which when we exercise, the body becomes more, has a greater potential for anabolic activity, or the muscle does. So as you exercise muscle, you get an increase in glucose transporters on the plasma membrane, you get an increase in amino acid transporters on the plasma membrane, you stimulate an increase in messenger RNA, et cetera. And so the muscle is geared up to respond positively to nutrient intervention. However, this only lasts for a certain amount of time. And it's probably over, it probably maximizes about 15 to 30 minutes post-exercise and then declines. And after about an hour, you're back pretty much back down to baseline because these transporters and all rescind back into the cytosols. So immediately post-exercise or somewhere within the first 35, 40 minutes of, of exercise, nutrient intervention can be very important in increasing muscle glycogen stores, but also enhancing protein synthesis. And this is shown in Krebs and Hayes' work out of Australia in which they had uh, college-age students participate in a class of resistance exercise training. They, they worked out for 
X number of weeks, I think it was like uh, eight weeks or something like that, to get to a certain level. And then they split the group into two groups, and then they trained them for another 10 weeks. And during that last 10 weeks of training, they gave them a carbohydrate protein supplement either pre-post exercise, one before and one after the exercise bout, or in the morning and in, in the evening. And the group that got the supplement around the workout versus those in the morning, getting it in the morning and the evening. Remember, the workout's the same, supplement's the same, it's just timing that's the difference. You can see that over that 10 weeks of training, there was twice the increase in lean body mass when the individuals received the supplement around the workout. They did muscle biopsies of the quadriceps, and what they found was is that uh, the individuals that got the supplement around the workout had greater increases in type 1 and uh, A, type 2A and 2X fibers, and of course the type 1 fibers were also larger but not statistically different. But anyway, this confirmed that the increase in lean body mass was due to a fact that, uh, that was increase in muscle mass. They also saw significant increases in strength. So when they looked at increases in bench strength over that 10 week period of time, squat and deadlift, you can see that the individuals did better when they received the supplement around the workout versus in the morning. So another study by Holmey out of uh, uh, Sweden in which he had subjects, uh, young men assigned randomly to a protein supplement or placebo or nine exercise control. The subjects uh, were provided, did resistance exercise training two days per week for 21 weeks and they were receiving whey protein uh, post-exercise. And what they found here was that the controls uh, change in body mass, not much change at all as you would expect. They weren't doing anything, they weren't receiving anything. The placebo group had a 2.8 uh, kilogram increase in body mass, but the group that received the protein had a significantly greater increase in body mass, up almost about 3.5 kilograms. When he looked at the increase in muscle cross-sectional area, uh, again, this was the uh, quadriceps femoris and the vastus lateralis, you can see that there was a much greater increase in muscle mass when they received the protein supplement post-exercise. <clears throat> so timing, I think, is really important for supplementation, and I think post-exercise uh, is important. There are some, uh, there's a meta-analysis and so forth that suggests that it's not, but when you use meta-analysis and you throw in all these studies, there's a lot of studies that have done things that would interfere with with this, and I won't go into all the details, but I do think personally that the timing and consuming nutrient post-exercise is extremely important. And even, I won't go into this today, but even if it doesn't increase muscle mass, it does reduce muscle soreness and allows you to recover faster, and so you can work out harder uh, the next day if you have subsequent days of exercise. So. I do think that post-exercise supplementation is extremely important. Uh, so what's the best type of uh, protein supplement? And we can look at this from an acute effect, you know. Uh, so we can give protein and measure protein synthesis. And this is uh, looking at protein qualities. So, is that right? Yeah, so one of the things you want to use a complete protein, one that is composed of all nine essential amino acids. The protein should contain a high amount of leucine because leucine is an activator of protein synthesis. Uh, whey protein has the highest amount of leucine and for an isolated protein and it's digested very rapidly and you want a rapidly digesting protein post-exercise and I'll explain why later. And if you're looking at this, protein isolates are the best to use. You can have protein concentrates, you can have protein isolates and so forth. Isolates are a much purer form of the protein. Right? So this is looking at, this is Tang's work in uh, uh, Stu Phillips's lab in which he looked at uh, muscle protein synthesis, fractal synthetic rate, uh, with whey protein, soy, and casein and you can see that post-exercise giving whey protein is significantly better than soy, and soy is significantly better than casein. Now remember, they're doing this post-exercise and they're looking at a three-hour window post-exercise here. All right, so for that three-hour window, whey is the best. 
Now, as you'll see later, I, or I'm not sure if I have any, casein actually comes back up. It just takes longer to digest casein, so its effects are delayed. But casein's still good, too. So if you want something that's delayed and a more long-term type of protein, casein would be good. And we'll talk about when we can use casein a little later. But post-exercise, there's nothing better than whey out there right now. <clears throat> so this is looking at it from a chronic perspective. What happens if, is, are these milk proteins really better than, say, soy protein and all? And this is a study by Hartman in which he had 56 young, healthy men. The resistance trained five days per week, split body protein a program for 12 weeks, you know, upper body and lower body. Uh, randomly assigned to three treatment groups, a milk group, <clears throat> which had 17.5 grams of protein in it and some carbohydrate, soy, which was isoenergic and isonitrogenous to the milk. Okay, so it had 17.5 grams of protein. And a uh, control group, which was just carbohydrate, which was isoenergetic to the soy. They consumed the drinks immediately post-exercise and then one hour later. So they're actually getting 34 grams of protein, right? And what they found was is that those that received the milk protein versus soy <coughs> and versus control, the uh, increase in uh, incline leg press strength was greater with the so uh, the uh, milk protein, knee extension increases were greater, and hamstring curl increases were greater in strength. When they looked at fiber types, and we'll just concentrate on these upper bars here, it's a little easier to represent. These are the differences between what you see down here between the black and the red. But we can see that uh, if we look at uh, type 2 fiber cross-sectional area, the increase with the milk protein significantly greater than that of soy, soy better than control. And also the type 1 fibers, uh, again, the milk protein uh, supplement generated a greater increase in cross-section area of the muscle than soy, and soy better than control. And if we look at fat and bone-free mass change, we can see that the milk was significantly better than soy and the control group. Right? So how much supplement do we have to have? And this is work by, uh, out of Stu Phillips' lab again in which uh, he showed that as you increase the amount of protein post-exercise, the rate of protein synthesis goes up. <clears throat> so 10 grams of protein, this was uh, actually whey protein they were using, uh, had a significant effect on protein synthesis. 20 was was best. When they gave 40, they didn't see any greater difference. Right? Some recent work out of Kevin Tipton's lab, McNaughton was the first author, however, showed that if they gave 40 grams versus 20 grams, they got a 16% increase in rate of protein synthesis, what was, which was significantly better than what they saw at 20. Now, there's probably a reason for this. If you look at Moore's work and and some of the other work out of that lab, they were using an isolated muscle group to study this. So they'd do knee extension, and then they would give the supplement, and they would look at protein synthesis across the limb, right? <clears throat> and in the, the muscles of the quadriceps. What Tipton's group did was a whole body workout. And this puts much greater stress on the protein supplement than the protein is, you know, blood flow isn't just maximized to the leg that's been worked out, but the whole body is going to have to distribute that amino acid appropriately. So what they said was is that when you use the whole body as a workout, you can actually benefit from taking in more than 20 grams of protein per day. Now the question is, is it financially worth it for a 16% increase in protein synthesis? And I would say probably not. Uh, you know, because when you double the amount of protein you're taking in, that's a real expense, right? And 16% isn't that great, although it's statistically different. So I would recommend really staying down here around 20, 25 grams of protein post-exercise and you're going to be fine. But I just wanted to point that out. Now, if we look at older individuals, we can see that 10 grams uh, protein supplement has no effect post-exercise. It takes 20 grams to see a significant increase in rate of protein synthesis and <clears throat> 40 grams to maximize it, right? 
we have what's called anabolic resistance. I hit that a few years ago. Uh, but uh, we don't respond to protein the same as young individuals. However, you can see there's not much difference actually if you take 40 grams, if older individuals take 40 grams versus individuals, young individuals that take 20. 40 grams of protein post-exercise is a lot of protein, very costly. However, you can get supplements and add a little leucine to it. Basically, what it comes down to is 20 grams of protein, high-quality protein like whey, has about 2 grams of leucine, which is significant to maximize protein synthesis. For older individuals, it's about 4. So you can take 20 grams of a good whey protein isolate, add 2 grams of leucine to it, and get the same effect you would if you took 40 grams of whey protein. So for young athletes, resistance training, a high quality protein supplement of 20 to 25 grams post-exercise consumed around the time of the exercise should maximize protein synthesis. For older individuals, uh, it's going to be about 35 to 40 grams of protein to be able to do that, or 20 grams plus some additional grams of leucine. Now frequency, how often can we do this? You know, how often can we stimulate protein synthesis during the day? So this is a study by, uh, out of uh, Mike Rennie's lab and Bob, Bob Wolf. And what they did was they infused uh, amino acids, 162 milligrams per kilogram body mass, over six hour period of time. So basically what they did was they infused, raised the blood levels of uh, free amino acids in the plasma and kept it up for six hours. They increased it by 1.7 fold. And then they looked at protein synthesis over that six hour period of time, muscle protein synthesis. And what they found was it took about 30 minutes or so before protein synthesis started to increase. And once it increased, it lasted for about 90 minutes to two hours. And then it came down. Although they continued to maintain the amino acid levels constant. All right, so basically what this says is that it's sort of like a, a neural impulse. You know, you stimulate the nerve, it, it uh, fires, and then it has a repolarization time period. It comes back down. You can't reactivate it for some time uh, with nerve fibers very quick, but this is the same basic principle. We activate it. It goes for a while. It comes down. You can't reactivate it for a while. You have to let it recover, and then you can reactivate again. How do we want to take that protein in as well is important. So this particular trial, uh, in separate, separate trials, eight healthy men consumed whey protein following resistance exercise, and they received it all in one bolus, 25 gram dose, or in 2.5 grams every 20 minutes for 200 minutes. So each got 25 grams, but one got it in very small quantities consistently over 20, every 20 minutes. The other group got it all immediately post-exercise. And they, uh, <clears throat> this is the resistance training program. So basically, this shows the blood essential amino acid levels. We can see that when we give the bolus, we get a very high level of uh, plasma amino acids. And then it comes down. It goes up and peaks about 40, 50 minutes after consumption, and then drops at, and comes back down to baseline in about two hours. Uh, if you give the smaller amounts <clears throat> every 20 minutes, you can see that the amino acid concentration elevates, but stays elevated for a much longer period of time, up to about five hours, and then comes back down. Areas under the curve for the amino acids are basically the same. Right. So why does that affect protein synthesis, though, over that six-hour period of time? And this is what happens. So if you look at myofibular protein, uh, you can see that when you give that large bolus, the rate of protein synthesis is significantly greater than that when you pulse the protein or give small quantities over time. So this is important. And what we know is that there's a threshold level for protein synthesis. The amino acid levels in the plasma have to get to a certain level uh, to stimulate protein synthesis maximally. And you have to reach that, that level. And to give just small quantities of protein, uh, amino acids or protein over a prolonged period of time is not going to get you to that threshold level. So recommendation from this research then is that supplementation should be in large boluses to maximize the rate of protein synthesis and spaced about two and a half to three hours apart 
to accommodate the protein synthesis refractory period. So what you want to do is turn it on, give some time down, and then turn it on again. So consider this with meals. So if I was uh, going to work out in the afternoon, I would have my breakfast, lunch, uh, maybe my workout, post-exercise supplement, and then two or three hours after that, my meal that would be high in protein, all right? And then a couple hours after that, I'd go to bed, and as you'll see, we'll take a protein supplement before going to bed as well. So you can work it out so that you're stimulating protein synthesis throughout the day and taking in, using that not only with supplementation, but working it in with your meals. Now, another time that we want to consider taking in a, a, a supplement is prior to going to bed. So this is work by Peter Reese, who was in my lab some years ago, but he did this work while he was in Scandinavia. Uh, he took the idea from my lab, <laughs> which is okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, so what Peter did was he had 16 subjects perform a resistance exercise training protocol <clears throat> at 8 o'clock at night, and it lasted for an hour. The subjects were provided a carbohydrate protein supplement immediately post-exercise. And then prior to going to bed at 11.30, the subjects received 40 grams of casein. And remember I talked about casein. Slow digesting keeps amino acid levels up for a prolonged period of time. Whole body and muscle protein synthesis was then determined for seven hours during sleep. And this is what he found. So this is looking at whole body protein synthesis kinetics now. Uh, protein breakdown, whole body wasn't affected, but you can see that when they had the supplement prior to going to bed, that whole body protein synthesis was significantly elevated. And rather than have a net nitrogen, uh, a, a negative nitrogen balance during sleep, in other words, loss of muscle during the sleep, they actually had a positive nitrogen balance. When they looked at <coughs> overnight mixed muscle protein synthesis, you can see that that was significantly elevated when they had a protein supplement prior to going to bed versus a placebo. Right? And a lot of athletes I know have wake up in the middle of the night and take a protein supplement and all that, and that's crazy to do. You don't want to interfere your, with your sleep. It's too important. But you can take a protein supplement prior to going to bed, 30 minutes prior to going to bed, and in some cases, uh, Actually, uh, we've developed, I'm working with a company, we've developed a product for this very purpose. And we're actually finding that people that take it actually sleep better. It actually helps their sleep, so, uh, as well as I hope helps their protein synthesis. Okay, so we looked at it from an acute effect. What about chronically? Is there any evidence that it really has any benefit? And so this study was by Snyder sure, uh, in the same lab that Peter was working in in Scandinavia, in which they took 44 young men and randomly assigned them to receive a pre-supplement protein carbohydrate supplement or a non-caloric placebo. They exercised 12 weeks on a resistance training program. Uh, there were three training sessions per week. Uh, the protein carbohydrate supplement was 27.5 grams of protein, and, and this was casein and casein hydrolysis and 15 grams of carbohydrate. Post-exercise, they also got a supplement, okay? But everybody got the supplement post-exercise. When they looked at the changes in quadricep, muscle, cross-section, or area, the group that received the protein supplement prior to going to bed has significantly greater increase in muscle mass than those that received the placebo, right? The only difference is getting the supplement post uh, uh, prior to going to bed. When they looked at changes in muscle fiber size, you can see the type 1 fibers, there was a um, trend for a greater increase in type 1 fiber cross-sectional area, and there was a significant increase in the cross-sectional area to type 2 fibers in those individuals that had the protein supplement, carbohydrate protein supplement, prior to going to bed. And when they looked at total strength, this was actually a combination of quadriceps and, I uh, mean, um, squat and bench press, uh, those that had the protein supplement had a greater increase in strength during that 12-week training period. Now another thing I want to talk about is carbohydrate because a lot of people, particularly if they're uh, strength athletes, they want to stay away from carbohydrate. 
Uh, they think the only thing that they need post-exercise is a um, uh, protein supplement. Still got about 15 okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm on time here. So I, I want to show you that I think carbohydrate in combination with protein is really important. So this is looking at it from an acute perspective, and this is why most people suggest that post-exercise carbohydrates have no real benefit to promoting protein synthesis. And this is work by Koopman <coughs> in, in, uh, from Denmark, in which she had 10 subjects perform both upper and lower body resistance exercise lasting one hour. The subject received a beverage uh, volume of 2.5 milliliters per kilogram body weight every 30 minutes to ensure a given dose of 0.3 grams per kilogram of casein uh, protein hydroxylate per hour combined with either no carbohydrate, 0.15 grams per kilogram body weight per hour carbohydrate, or 0.6 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight per hour, right? So low carbohydrate, high carbohydrate, no carbohydrate. One, one of the things I have a complaint here is that using casein is not a good protein if you're looking at short-term protein synthesis, okay? But f even forget that. Let's just say that it works fine, all right? And what they found was is that there was no difference in the rate of protein synthesis during the uh, first few hours post-exercise or post-supplementation <clears throat> uh, between protein alone, low-carbohydrate protein, or high-carbohydrate protein. So no beneficial effect. However, if we look at chronic studies, and I'm just going to show you one, but there are others. And this is by Bird out of Australia, in which he took 32 subjects and trained them for 12 weeks, consuming several different nutritional interventions. Supplements consumed during exercise and post-exercise were placebo, a 6% carbohydrate solution, 6 grams of essential amino acids. The 6 grams of essential amino acids is essentially 20 grams of whey protein. All right? It's the equivalent of 20 grams of whey protein. Or the combination of carbohydrate and essential amino acids. So what they did was they worked out and during the workouts, they would drink this drink, sip it, and then at the end of the, of the workout, they would consume a large amount. So what he found was is that, and this, uh, this represents body mass, fat-free mass, and fat mass. Here, these bars, the open bar represents the placebo group, the hatch bar represents the carbohydrate group, the shaded bar represents the essential amino acid group, and the black bar represents the combination of carbohydrate essential amino acids. And if we look at body mass, we can see that taking in carbohydrate or essential amino acid post-exercise increased the amount of body mass that was gained during that 12 weeks of resistance exercise training. However, if you did the combination, you had a significantly greater increase in body mass. Well, let's look at fat-free mass. And we can see that fat-free mass paralleled the increase in body mass. And in fact, the increase in fat-free mass was significantly greater than that of body mass due to the fact that there was a significant amount of fat mass lost during the workout. So this increase in body mass actually represents an increase in fat-free mass. And fat-free mass actually increasing more than fat, uh, body mass altogether. But we can see that that combination of carbohydrate essential amino acids is so much better than just the essential amino acids or carbohydrate alone. They did muscle biopsies and they looked at the increase in cross-sectional area of the different muscle fiber types. So the black represents type 1 fibers, the hatch lines type 2A, and the uh, shaded area here, or open area, represents the 2B fibers. Now at the top of each bar, and I don't know how, you know, you can see it pretty well, you can see this open space, and that represents the increase in fiber cross-sectional area that occurred during that 12 weeks of training. So placebo here, you can see it's 7% for type 1 fibers, 9% for type 2A, and 7% for 2B. Now contrast that with the carbohydrate and essential amino acid group, 22, 27, and is that 20. 
or 23, 27, 20. And you can see that that's significantly better than what you see over here of 18, 17, 13, or 14, 16, 18. So this increase in, in lean body mass is in fact due to an increase in muscle fiber size. So what's going on? So if we look at protein accretion, and that's really what we're concerned about, right? Not, not protein synthesis. How much muscle can I actually lay down? How much muscle actually develops? And what is that, uh, what determines that? And that, what determines that is not just protein synthesis, but the rate of protein degradation. So what's the turnover rate here? <clears throat> so if we go back to some work by, out of uh, Bob Wolf's lab, we can look at, the effects of insulin on all this. So if we, here's protein synthesis, protein degradation. Without insulin, with insulin. So in this study we have, uh, here's protein synthesis at rest under fasting conditions. Protein synthesis is 30, pro rate of protein degradation 46. We're in negative nitrogen balance. When we're fasting, we're losing muscle. <clears throat> Post-exercise in a fasted condition. Protein synthesis is activated, it's significantly activated, but so is protein degradation. And it, protein synthesis does not overtake protein degradation, and we are still in negative nitrogen balance. So if we work out and don't consume any nutrients, we st we're still losing muscle faster than we're gaining. Now, if we infuse some insulin under resting conditions, what happens? Under resting conditions, protein synthesis increases. Nothing changes with protein degradation, but protein synthesis can ex increase above protein degradation, and we have a positive nitrogen balance. What happens if we work out, exercise, and infuse insulin? Well, the exercise itself increases protein synthesis. Additional insulin has no effect. But what insulin does do, which is extremely important post-exercise, is it blocks protein degradation. So now, if we stimulate protein synthesis with exercise, raise insulin levels, and block protein degradation, we have a significant increase in positive nitrogen balance. All right? So basically what we're saying, and this, this is Bird's work, in which he looked at the rate of protein degradation by measuring 3-methylhistidine in the urine. 3-methylhistidine is an amino acid that's found in myosin, you find it in the urine, myosin's being broken down. So you can see that in the placebo group, immediately post-exercise, 24 hours post-exercise during the first week, they were stimulating a large amount of, of 3-methylhistine, a lot of tissue breakdown. Uh, the carbohydrate essential amino acids blocked some of that. But look how much was blocked with the combination of carbohydrate essential amino acids. Right? And also at week 12. So significantly less muscle breakdown when taking in carb, uh, carbohydrate essential amino acids versus essential amino acid or just protein or just carb or particularly a placebo. <clears throat> now, so this is basically what's going on. And I won't, I won't go into the exercise part here, but if we give post-exercise essential amino acids, or give protein, and we raise the essential amino acid levels, and particularly leucine, we activate mTOR. And this is going to activate protein synthesis, all right? Uh, translation, initiation, and uh, production of ribosomes, and we're gonna activate protein synthesis. But when we give the carbohydrate, we elevate insulin levels. Protein elevates insulin levels very little but carbohydrate elevates it a lot. But what's important is when you combine carbohydrate with protein, you get a synergistic effect on a secretion of insulin. So you get a very high insulin response when you combine the two. This insulin activates AKT, which inhibits a protein called FOXO3A. And FOXO3A is responsible for, is activated during exercise and responsible for promoting protein degradation. But when you elevate insulin levels, FOXO3A is inhibited and protein degradation goes down. So the combination of carbohydrate plus protein stimulates protein synthesis, blocks protein degradation, and increases net protein accretion. So it looks like this. So if we look on the left-hand side here, 
rate of protein synthesis and degradation, and on the bottom, protein consumption. Now this is post-exercise as we increase the amount of protein in the diet, or in the supplement, protein synthesis goes up and then becomes maximized. Somewhere around 20 to 25 grams of protein, right? Supplement. Now if we change that x-axis to plasma insulin level, and we look at the rate of protein degradation, all right, we can see that post-exercise, protein degradation is higher than protein synthesis. So we're in net nitrogen balance. All right? As we increase the amount of protein in the supplement, we reach a point where protein synthesis exceeds the rate of protein degradation, and so we start getting protein accretion. Only when protein synthesis exceeds protein degradation do we get protein accretion. Right? Now, if we only get protein, the protein doesn't have much effect on reducing protein degradation. So our supplement, protein supplement, is increasing protein accretion by a small amount. However, if we give the carbohydrate, now the difference between degradation and synthesis becomes very strong, and we increase protein accretion significantly. Right. So, overall recommendations then, we want to consume between 1.6 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. We want to consume protein three to four hour, at three to four hour intervals during the course of the day, including meals. Equalize protein consumption across the three daily meals, trying to get in 25 to 30 grams of protein each meal. Supplement during or post-exercise with 25, 20 to 25 grams of protein if you're younger than 50. If you're older, 50 or older, you want to be up about 35 to 40 grams or 20 grams plus some additional leucine. Use a high quality, rapidly digesting protein such as whey isolate for your post-exercise supplement. And the reason I say that is, there's no need to take a slow-acting protein like casein because it takes too long to activate the system and the next thing you know you're eating. You want something right away that's going to turn on protein sense very rapidly, spike it, get it up very high, and then come down and then recover and eat again. So whey protein is the best at, for that particular time, I think, whey isolate. Add carbohydrate to your post-exercise protein supplement. Uh, for those doing resistance exercise, it doesn't take a whole lot of carbohydrate to get that insulin level up. So anywhere between 0.5 to 1 or 2 to 1 ratio of carbohydrate to protein is fine. So if you're taking in 20, 25 grams of protein, uh, you know, if you want 10 grams or 15 grams of carbohydrate with that, that's fine. If you want to double it and have 60, that's fine if you're interested in, in trying to improve muscle glycogen stores and things like that. For endurance athletes, completely different. Uh, I'm not, not talking about endurance right now. Finally, consume a high protein, low carbohydrate snack about 30 to 60 minutes uh, before going to bed. And I think this protein should be something that's slowly digested. Uh, and I think that's going to have a better long-term effect. Uh, while you're sleeping. So something like a casein supplement, or you can use something like, uh, you know, have some uh, cottage cheese and, and uh, you know, pears or something like that, some kind of snack, or a, a turkey breast and milk. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a, a actual supplement. It can be food. Another great food to consume in post-exercise, really, and we've, shown, we've done uh, three or four studies uh, in this area is chocolate milk. Chocolate milk is a great post-exercise supplement that's cheap and inexpensive. It has a three to one ratio of carbohydrate to protein. Protein obviously is milk protein uh, and it works extremely well from a standpoint of promoting training adaptation and recovery. Okay, so with that I'll open it up for questions. Okay. Yes? So we see increase protein synthesis after resistance exercise. And then what if you, so if you follow that by like an endurance exercise to see a decrease in protein synthesis? Does nutrient timing affect that? Can it improve that? Is will make a difference? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure that the, res, the uh, I'm not up on what's happening when you 
do resistance exercise and follow that up right away with aerobic exercise. I'm not exactly sure that that's going to reduce the rate of um, muscle protein synthesis or development. In fact, I, I think I read something not too long ago that they actually in Scandinavia showed that it actually increased the rate of muscle development when you did that. As far as supplementation goes, uh, it depend on how long after the workout that I was doing the uh, resistance ec or the aerobic exercise. But, you know, when I talk about nutrient timing and talk about post-exercise, actually you can take it, it's around the workout. You can take it d before the workout, you can take it during the workout. So if you did resistance exercise training, you could take in half the supplement after the resistance exercise and you could take in the other half the supplement with some added carbohydrate uh, after the aerobic exercise. And that's probably what I would do is supplement, you know, uh, and if you think about it, when you're doing the aerobic exercise, you're increasing muscle blood flow to those areas and so forth. So take advantage of it by getting in the supplement after the workout, the first workout, and then after this, you know, at least part of it. And then after that, take in some, some more. You were talking about uh, peak protein synthesis after taking away and how it happens like within an hour or so <clears throat> of taking that. Um, and then you have the spike of hormones post-workout. So do you ever, do you recommend like trying to have those collide where like you take protein either before you exercise or during, like say near the end of your, your workout uh, to help like have those happen at the same time? Yeah, so I, I don't think much protein. I, didn't, I don't have the slide. Well, I, yeah, I don't have the slide here. I, I really don't think there's much of an advantage to taking the supplement uh, before exercise or, or during the actual exercise. Although there is one study uh, by Kevin Tipton that suggested that taking the protein supplement prior to exercise was more beneficial than taking it post-exercise. But that was refuted by a couple of other studies. Uh, the reason I, I, I say that is that if you think about it, um, when you exercise, uh, the protein, all right, when, when we exercise, it's the muscle groups that are exercising that are going to respond to nutrient intervention and grow, right? So if I just exercise the legs, I'm not going to get stronger arms, right? Okay. So what that tells me is that there's localized control. Right. So when I'm exercising too, there's a lot of energy required to do that exercise. So my ATP, ADP levels are reduced, my glycogen store is going to be reduced and so forth, and that's going to activate certain proteins that are going to block protein synthesis because protein synthesis is an energy requiring process. And I don't want to use that energy on protein synthesis when I'm requiring it for generating uh, muscle development. That's where I want to my energy to be concentrated. So I don't think a lot's going to go on protein synthesis-wise at that time. And I can show you that if you, and, and we've done this with isolated proteins, looking at like things like GLUT4 and myosin and so forth. If post-exercise, if, if I exercise a rat and take the muscle and haven't given the, the rat any, or let the rat recover for, let's say, five hours, what happens is there's very little protein synthesis goes if I fast that rat. There's very little. Messenger RNAs go up, and they go up during exercise and post-exercise, but there's li little going on. It's only when I provide nutrients that I see an increase in, rapid increase in protein synthesis. And in fact, we show that it just, post-exercise, if we look at isolated in proteins that you would expect to respond to the exercise, go up dramatically, all right? So I think that the, what's, what exercise does is prepare the muscle to respond to nutrient intervention. So taking it during, there's not much going to be going on, but you, 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 know, you may have the nutrients there post-exercise ready if you take it before or during. But I don't see any purpose in doing that. I would just do it post-exercise. At that time, messenger RNA levels are elevated. You're ready to initiate uh, translation. You won't initiate translation though until the ATP ADP levels are back to normal, the glycogen stores back to normal, and these inhibitory enzymes have been uh, removed or you know deactivated. And that's what nutrients do. 
And so when we take nutrients in post-exercise, we increase the ATP, ADP ratio, we increase glycogen stores, we change the whole environment of the cell so that, hey, the cell is ready to respond and boom, it does. It does right away. And if you don't give those nutrients post-exercise, you don't get much response at all, at least in the rat from what we've done. So uh, it's not until you eat that you actually see that. But you get your best response when you supplement post-exercise versus waiting six hours, and we've shown that as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the worst thing that somebody can do if they're trying to lose weight is not, or <laughs> the thing that they need to do is think about, I'm not trying to lose weight, I'm trying to lose fat. Right? Okay. So, if, you know, and I don't want to stereotype, but most females I've talked to in gyms and asked what they're doing nutritionally and so forth, is after a workout, the last thing they're going to do is supplement, right? Why? Because, oh, God, I just spent 500 kilo, kilo, uh, uh, calories on the treadmill. I'm not going to eat anymore. You know, I'm, I'm trying to lose weight. That's the worst thing they could do. Because what you want to do is actually pro, uh, stimulate protein synthesis. And if you take in a carbohydrate protein supplement post-exercise, and you don't have to take in a whole lot, but you need to activate the system, what we were talking about. So what happens, if you think about it, and we've actually shown this, post-exercise, if someone takes nothing, all right, uh, you know, their metabolic rate will actually drop and actually continue down below baseline. All right? If you take in a supplement, you take in a carbohydrate protein supplement, okay? So what does the body want to do with that? Right? What's it going to do with the protein? It's going to be used, it's going to be broken down. Those amino acids are going to be used for protein synthesis, right? And that's an energy requiring process, right? When you, and you, it helps keep metabolism up. You take in the carbohydrate, you're replenishing what? Muscle glycogen stores. This first requirement of the body is to re replenish carbohydrate stores. If you look at what happens when you take carbohydrate in post-exercise, it's increased muscle glycogen stores. Beyond liver or anything else, it's increased that. Energy requiring process. So we've got taken in the carbohydrate, we've taken in the protein. Those are both energy requiring processes and we're using those nutrients. So where is the energy coming from? It's coming from burning fat. That individual, takes in a carbohydrate protein supplement post-exercise is going to maintain muscle mass or actually increase it and burn more fat and lose more fat than they will. They may not lose as much weight, but that's irrelevant, right? In fact, they probably don't want to lose that weight. If they're just working out and fasting, they're going to lose as much muscle mass as they are going to lose fat, okay? So I know I've got to go, so. <laughs> okay, thanks guys, hope you enjoy it.